Hello and welcome to Science Gallery Dublin. I'm Jane Gleeson, the Events and Community Manager at the Gallery, and today I'm here with Gail Wellstead of the Design History Society. We're delighted to present the final event in the Invisible Programme, an exhibition that explores the known and the unknown of the universe through physics and astrophysics. So Gail will tell you a little bit more about Light Switch. So Light Switch is all about telling you the story of how electric light has redesigned our lives and the loss of darkness that this has given us. So we hear every day that new technology is influencing the way that we live, but actually electric light that introduced about 100 years ago is still having this macro influence on how we live our lives. So we have two sessions for you today, one on electric light and body and home, and another that expands out to the city and environment. We're very excited to bring together designers and, and scientists to tell the story of electric light. So we strongly encourage you to get involved in the conversation online by following the hashtag LightSwitch2020 on Twitter or following at SciGalleryDub, our So Design History. You can also join the conversation on YouTube. So if you're not watching on YouTube directly, click into the video and to the right of the screen, you'll see the chat function. A number of panelists will be getting involved in the conversation, so you can ask them some questions or feel free to express any feedback that you might have about the topics covered today. Please do keep those questions coming in. There'll be a panel with all six speakers at the end, uh, with me posing your questions to them and having a conversation about how we might design for darkness in everyday life. I'll see you then. Oh, hi, my name is Saoirse O'Brien from NCAD and I'm going to talk today about rural electrification and the coming of domestic light to Irish homes. And an awful lot of this is building on the fact that after electricity had been discovered and electrical power started being harnessed in the late 19th century, looking at Ireland that you have small generating stations being built in Dublin and in some of the larger cities and towns in the late 19th century but actually coming into the 20th century it's only with the building of the Shannon scheme power station at Arden Crusher that you have anything approaching a national grid being created and this Shannon Scheme power station is, it was built in the late 1920s after independence as probably the largest infrastructure project that was done for several decades. And what's interesting about it though, is that as well as harnessing the power of the Shannon to try and provide electrical power to Irish homes, it's actually done with using the expertise of German company Siemens, basically because you don't have that sort of expertise within the state at this point. It's also the point where the ESB, the Electricity Supply Board, is founded, first of all to run the station, but then actually the national grid that's created. And you also have lots and lots of images of this being circulated at the time, everything from postcards to uh, paintings and everything in between. And I've just got one example of this here quickly to look at Sean Keating's painting, Night's Candles Are Burnt Out, because as many of Keating's paintings were allegorical, this is very much an allegory about light, where it's tying the coming of electrical light to the new order and the new state of affairs in this new state and Keating's hopes for the same. So the idea that, you know, the candle will disappear, the oil lamp will disappear and that we'll all be lighting our homes with electric light. At this point, he was looking at this as something that was actually quite revolutionary. And it's something that the ESB had plans to start rolling out during the 1930s across the whole country, because what they do, first of all, is connect all of the large cities and towns and supply Shannon power 
to all of those places. But then the project to actually roll that out to the rest of the countryside into every hill and valley that they can, that they can it gets stalled by the Second World War. So it's really only the end of 1946 that it gets going. But what you have happening over the following 20 years is the rural electrification scheme that is launched in November 1946 and runs until the mid 60s, the main scheme. And then there's a post-development scheme that runs into the 1970s. Um, to try and bring people who hadn't signed up the first time and various sort of very isolated locations into the network. And what you have the ESB doing is setting up this official rural electrification scheme and the OREO division of the ESB dividing the country up into 792 separate areas and then working through those, signing up customers, installing poles, installing the stringing the wires, attaching them to buildings and then having official switch ons. And the ESB archives have a, a fantastic website, including this map, which is an in, interactive map where you can look at every area in the state and find out when it was actually actually electrified. Um, so it's really interesting to go and look at the area that you, it, it, either you live in or there if you know well when it was actually connected to the grid. And what you have happening during this time is that the rural electrification scheme was endorsed by a succession of governments throughout the 50s and 60s, very much with the aim of improving rural living conditions and reducing poverty in the countryside. And this is where providing electricity and running water on the farm and in the farmhouse was intended to try and help reduce emigration out of the country, which in the 1950s was peaking. And it's particularly about trying to reduce the very high number of young women who are emigrating out of the country at the time by purposefully trying to make the home a more attractive place to stay in and provide all the mod cons that would have been available in London or in Liverpool or in New York. And these homes then, because quite in quite a lot of places in the country, you would still have traditional cottages where people are living in interiors that would be totally recognisable to their grandparents with very, very traditional layouts. In this case, this is a two room cottage in Menlo and Galway. And you're basically looking at a structure where everything takes place in or around the open fireplace or in and around the hearth. So cooking takes place on the hearth. You dry clothes around it. You use it as a source of light as well as a source of heat. And an awful lot of interaction takes place around this as a focus. Um, and there's lots of movable furniture, so things like chairs, tables, the little creaky stools arranged or ar around the place and, and are moved in and out over to the wall, over to the fire as needed. But then also having pieces of some pieces of built in furniture, like outshot beds and larger pieces like dressers or settle beds that had fixed positions. But it's still very much a an interior that's lit by candles, by oil lamps, maybe by gas as well. Um, but it, in a lot of places, it hasn't changed all of that much from one that, you know, decades before. And this is one of the things that the ESB were particularly trying to do, often with the help of organisations like the Irish Country Women's Association. But the ESB was very much about trying to educate people about electricity and what can you actually do with electricity? How much can you light with it? Um, what, there's an awful lot of the advertisements are talking about what a unit can do. Um, and one of, this is one of the problems that they were running into was a lack of education and a lack of knowledge among the, the, the general population as to what you could actually do with electricity and part of the research for this project we had done a whole number of oral history interviews a couple of years ago and this is one of them this is rose hooley and cork talking about one of the the stories going around 
per area. So. There was a story going around that some some guy, one of the one of the old men in the parish, I don't know how true it was, it probably is told in every parish that he used light a match to find a find a switch. <laughs> or light a candle to find a switch. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure it never happened, but anyway, that was the story. And this is something that I've heard repeatedly from people all the way across the country that you're looking at uh, quite a lot of people who aren't really sure what this electricity thing is. A lot of cases, their closest reference point is gas, which is kind of leaky, um, but you can't smell it and it's invisible, or you can smell it and it's invisible. But people are going, you know, doing things like putting caps on the plugs because they're worried that the electricity is going to leak out. And it's not everybody that's doing this, but this is quite, quite common. Um, and this is very much what the ESB education programs were intended to do, both in terms of going around with sales vans like this, showing people products, but also then looking at advertisements and um, to public talks and things like this as well, and demonstrations. But what you have happening is a very, very slow set of changes to the Irish interior and the Irish particularly rural interior, where over the decades, what you have is a sort of a hybrid form chain developing between the traditional hearth and then the ideal modern kitchen, which is being shown in advertisements, it's been shown in um, you know, films, it's been seen as the, the, the the modern model outside of the country. But what you have happening is a process of people trying to figure out how do I combine this new infrastructure into my existing house? Um, and what you actually tend to get is this hybrid form that's somewhere in between a traditional hearth and a fitted kitchen. And this is a really good example from Lickettstown in County Kilkenny, where over to the right of the photograph is the out of shot is the hearth with the, the you know, armchair sitting beside it and so on. But there's a, a GEC electric cooker freestanding here with the cable over the uh, wallpaper. And then there's wooden furniture, including a traditional settle there. And also as well, I'll come back to the, the sacred heart lamp as well making use of this new electrical power to power the devotional object. And what you have happening is very much a, a slow move. Despite things like this, this is 1950s model kitchen that was designed uh, between the ESB and the ICA as an ideal farm kitchen, combining the best of tradition and modernity. And it's a a version of a fitted kitchen. But even though they, this was being shown as models in the 1950s, it's not until the 1970s that you actually get this being taken up on a much more common basis. Basically, in the wake of Bungalow Bliss, Jack Fitzsimmons' book from 1972, where he's publishing a book of plans about of how do you actually create your own self-build bungalow. And that's where you actually start to get the fitted kitchens being developed and things being built in rather than added on to older interiors. And this is the sort of thing where you have this contrast between the romance and the reality of living in the countryside and living in a, a real Irish house, a real Irish kitchen at the time, that advertising might have been showing something that's very, very bright, very modern, um, lots of very smooth surfaces, um, very bright lighting and it's the reality of it is not quite so um pristine and it's much more like Bridget O'Grady here um who's photographed by the National Museum because she was still um churning butter in her kitchen but this is the sort of interior that you're looking at at the time and what you also have as well is this wave of decoration following the electric light being installed across the country because suddenly you've got electric light that 
is actually got a much brighter illumination in, of the interior than it would be possible with gas or with um, oil or candles. And I'll let Josephine Helly tell you about it here. I have great memories of turning on that one switch <laughs> and seeing light. It was such a wonderful thing. We never, even though they were crude looking when we know when we think about them now. Oh, let's turn it on. But everything seemed dirty when you turned down the light. The light was so good and in, in comparison to what we had before. What did you so, and this reaction to electric light is something that I've seen all the way across the country. When we've been interviewing women who are now in their, you know, late 60s, 70s and 80s, who were young women at the time when their areas got electricity. And there is a, a, the very much a reaction to this as something that is really actually changing the quality of their life. And it's always referred to as the light as well. Did you get the light in? And one of these examples is that as part of the project that I did and the exhibition in the National Museum, we worked with a group of local women in Castle Bar to produce some textile art that's based on their experiences with rural electrification. And this is one of those which was done by Noreen Durkin, which is quoting her grandmother on light being switched on in Mayo in the 1950s saying it's like a light from heaven. And this is something, this connection with it being almost heavenly is uh, something that you do also see with the rapid electrification of the sacred heart lamp, where the traditional sacred heart lamp that you have here on the left from Claudia Kinmut's book is, you're looking at this idea of the shelf with the originally the oil lamp on it and then the, the picture of the sacred heart and maybe some devotional um, you know this has got glasses of flowers or vases of flowers on it where that's actually being electrified in this case this one has got the cable being run down to the light and the electric um, bulb put in but also then more sophisticated ones being developed like the one on the right hand side with this whole elaborate backboard with the whole thing mounted on it and then edged with guilt. So it's this idea of actually electrifying devotion in the home as well as actually everything else that you have going on there. And what I'll actually do then is just to, to wrap up is to say that what you have happening in the Irish home particularly is electrical power and electric light making a huge difference to everyday life and allowing people to read later, allowing people to carry, you know, work on crafts later and to be, it also brings down the television as well and the end of a lot of older styles of storytelling and visiting. But I'll leave the last word here to Maura about having the perspective of having lived through this change. Well, Anthony, else you'd like to add to that now, Maura? I don't think so. I think that if any, if anyone that's under 50 now heard me talking, they'd be saying, well, that one must be 100 years that old. That one must be living in the dark ages. Yeah, <laughs> yes. but those things could never have happened. You know, that they really they didn't. Um, well, do you think uh, it's better for the, them ones now that I never went through any hardship and grew up just with the flick of a switch everywhere and well you know. i suppose it's better for the mary but this is why i suppose they weren't able to cope with the recession as well as people of my age because we were reared with not having yeah we remember <laughs> and we appreciated what we had whereas the young people are born with it and they find it very hard to accept if, if does know, it go slow if anywhere it goes slow yeah. for them yeah Thank you.
Hello and welcome to the next lecture in this uh, really exciting and interesting event. So my name is Andrew Coogan, I'm a professor of psychology at Maynooth University. Um, I'm also a chronobiologist, so that's someone who works on biological timekeeping and sleep. And in this field we're really interested in what light does to our biological clocks and what implications um, man-made lighting has for, for those clocks and for sleep and for quality of life and for our physical health. So that's what I'm going to touch on today, a bit about the dark side of light, but also the light side of dark. So we all know that the Earth rotates on its axis and in doing so creates a, uh, a light-dark cycle. So we have day characterized by the presence of light and we have night characterized by the absence of sunlight. Now, over the course of somewhere between two and three billion years, as life has evolved on Earth, it has evolved to take into consideration um, those repeating cycles of light and darkness, now what we now term a day. And to help animals uh, to best adapt and to exploit those changes, those rhythmic changes in light and darkness, animals developed a set of internal clocks which we term circadian clocks. So these circadian clocks regulate our physiology and our behavior around a 24-hour period or a time frame. And they do so, so to maximize the uh, appropriateness of what we do relative to if it's light or if it's dark outside. So, for example, here we can see that there are differences in the timing of when we would normally sleep. We all know we normally sleep at night. Um, when our body temperature is lowest, that's also at, at night in the wee small hours of the morning. Um, but things like our physiology, so things like blood pressure, changes throughout the day. So it's high in the day, lower at night normally. Um, things like aspects of our cognition and our cognitive performance. So, for example, something like reaction time, how quickly we can react to a situation or stimulus is higher in the middle of the day than it is at night. So humans, like all other animals, have evolved this timekeeping system that allows us to regulate our uh, physiology and, and our behavior on a 24 hour basis so that it is appropriate to the um, light dark changes that happen as the earth rotates on its axis. Now we actually know quite a bit about um, how the circadian clock works and um, the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine was awarded in this field a few years ago. So one of the key things we know in is in the brain we have a um, we have a master clock in an area known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So this is like the master clock. This is the thing that ticks away in a 24 hour basis. But like any clock, it runs not exactly to 24 hours. So it runs a bit fast or a bit slow. So it needs to be tweaked or reset every day just to keep it bang on 24 hours. And that happens by light coming in and hitting our eyes and the retinas in our eyes and then that message is being passed down the optic nerve from our retinas into our brain and reaching the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now one of the things we know is that this suprachiasmatic nucleus clock is not the only clock we have in our body. Actually there's loads of clocks. There's loads of clocks in different areas of the brain and in different organs of the body like the liver and the heart and lungs. And basically the SEN clock acts like a conductor, a master orchestrator of all those other clocks and says, hey guys, this is the time, get into this time. So everything works in concert. Everything is, is nice and what we term synchronized. Now, if we think back into our relatively um, recent human history, before we had electric lighting, 
the only major source of lighting in our environment was the was the sun and therefore when the sun rose we wanted to exploit the presence of the light so we would organize lots of activities around the presence of the sun and sunlight but when the sun went down if the only thing you had available to you was candlelight very dim candlelight and light from fires and torches um, there was a very limited amount of work you could do for example you couldn't farm you couldn't work in the fields effectively or safely under those types of light levels so our behavior was really really linked to the natural um, light dark cycle so when it got um, dark we'd go to bed and actually the, in medieval times the typical thing across many societies was actually to have two sleeps so you went to bed for example early in the evening when the sun went down and you slept maybe for three or four hours and then you woke up and you had maybe an hour or two socializing before going back to sleep um, for, for the rest of the night until it was dawn and once it was dawn you could go out in the field <coughs> or do whatever work it is that you had to do and even we see um, in the arrangement of monastic life in the Middle Ages, this pattern as well. So, for example, in the patterns of prayers said throughout the day, that you had matins, and the matins were prayers said somewhere between midnight and dawn. So, often when the monks would have their first sleep, then wake up, and then they'd say their matins. And then lords with the prayers said around sunrise. So again, just, just a really nice example of us synchronizing our behavior to this presence and absence of light driven by the rotation of the Earth on its axis. Now, this all changes in the late 19th century with the invention by Edison and Swan and others of electric lighting. So electric lighting is significant in and of itself. But what's really important about electric lighting is it allowed us to break free from the idea that the only presence of uh, significant light was driven by the natural uh, day-night cycle. So now we could produ produce electric lighting whenever we wanted to. So we could use it at night to illuminate the night. And one of the big implications this had was in working. So now instead of maybe factories having to stop operating when it was too dark, we could use electric lighting so factories and other industrial settings could operate 24 hours a day. And this has led to, um, to the invention, if you like, of shift work. So, and particularly shift work that involves night work, and by that we mean work between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m. And actually in, in westernized industrial economies um, about one in five workers work shift patterns. So it's, a, it's a very large number of people. And these people work across a whole range of settings. So for example in, in service settings like um, retail and taxi drivers but also in things like police and security forces in medicine, um, in industrial settings. So, for example, if you have an oil rig out in the North Sea, that operates 24 hours a day, and in settings like uh, the aviation industry. Now, clearly, a lot of these uh, services are essential. So, we need 24-hour medical services. Um, for lots of industrial settings, it's not practicable not to run an industrial operation non-stop but there is a price to pay for this so we know now over the course of 20 years or so of uh, public health research that shift work is implicated as an important risk factor for a number of common and significant diseases and disorders so for example shift work appears to raise your risk of particular cancers, um, particularly hormone dependent cancers, and these include some of the most common cancers such as breast cancers in women and prostate cancers in men. Now, it's important what we're talking about, it's not the new smoking, 
and the elevation of risk is much 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 smaller than that associated for example with smoking but it's still there and it does appear to be significant and it is very significant when we think that we have probably hundreds of millions of people in the world working shift it's also implicated in increased risk of cardiovascular disease um, in increased risk for something like diabetes type 2 diabetes um, but it's also appears to be linked with what we term neurobehavioral impairments so there for example increased risks of having workplace accidents and not only workplace accidents one area that wasn't really focused on a lot um, until quite recently is the increased risk of shift workers to have motor vehicle accidents in the commute home so electric lighting has enabled us to do shift work but in enabling us to do it and that has lots of advantages obviously there are disadvantages for the health and well-being of shift workers another implication of this and I'm sh which we'll have heard about in other talks in this session is that electric lighting now has led to the preponderance of uh, light pollution so this is the presence of man-made light at night when the sky should otherwise be dark and we see this here and we see this map of the world and the uh, light at night pollution we see how it sort of um, mirrors the urbanicity um, of so the denseness of population um, across across the world here so for example here's the east coast of america here very densely populated and you can see it's very bright and this um light pollution comes from various sources so it comes from sources we're very familiar with outside uh things like street lighting and again we understand the need for street lighting uh but one of the uh unwanted side effects of street lighting is it increases this light at night this light pollution this man-made light pollution another thing we'd be very aware of is that there's lots of sources of electric lighting inside our homes so it's not just coming into our windows it's also present inside our homes for example light um, uh, from light emitting devices like your phone or a tablet or a laptop and there's quite a bit of concern um, at the moment around the impact of those light emitting devices on sleep. So here's some figures from the National Sleep Foundation in the US, but they look very similar here, about the amount of sleep uh, young people and adolescents typically get and the amount of sleep that they would be recommended to get. So, for example, if we look here in 15 to 17 year olds, um, about 56% of these get less than seven hours of sleep. Yet their parents rate only 20% of them get by okay in that amount of sleep. Likewise, 34% get eight hours, while the number, the proportion that should be getting that according to their parents, is 46%. And only 10% get nine, nine hours or more, while 35% of them should be getting that according to the parental ratings. So young people, and indeed other ages of people as well, are not typically achieving the duration of sleep that is recommended and that is informed by science. And one of the concerns is that with the advent of light emitting devices and like that those devices now are displacing sleep so when i were a lad when i was young they said the tv went off at 11 the test card came on the national anthem played and that was it there was nothing else you could go to bed and maybe read a book but that was it but now we've got this myriad of options open to us we can watch netflix all night on our phones if we want we can play computer games um on our tablets all night if we want so we've got this huge range of options and the price to pay for those may be that they're displacing sleep and as they displace sleep uh they're then spilling over into the next day 
where we're fatigued, we're sleepy, um, our cognition isn't as good as it might be, and if this goes on over a long period of time, it can also impair our physical health. So that's a concern. But it's not all bad. Light is not all bad. Um, so I want to give you an example here of an application in which light may be very useful for us. So this is a what we term an actigram of a healthy older adult. So basically what we see here is they're active in the day, inactive at night, and they're inactive at night because they're sleeping. Here is an same actigram but from an older adult with Alzheimer's disease. So we know Alzheimer's disease is a common and devastating dementia uh, happening mostly in older adults. And one of the things we see in dementias is that this differentiation between day and night becomes blunted. We see a lot less of it. So because we're having more naps during the day, but also we're having a lot more awakenings during the night and activity during the night, things like wandering and the like. Now, if we think about it, um, lots of these people with moderate to severe dementia have to be cared for in nursing homes. One of the features of nursing homes, if you ever go into a nursing home, is that they're somewhat dark places. So now, there's interest in actually saying, well, if we boost the amount of electric light in nursing homes during the day, so in their bedrooms and in the day rooms where the residents are during the day, we actually boost the amount of light. That might really help put back together their circadian rhythms, so make them more active during the day and then help them sleep at night because that differentiation between bright days and dark nights can really help reconstitute a weakened circadian rhythm. So this is just an example that light isn't all bad. We like electric lighting. It just is very dependent on the context and the use of it. Um, so it's not just the presence or absence is bad. It's when it's present, when it's absent, who it's present for, who it's absent for. So this is what I'm trying to say here in this slide. So light is not our enemy and electric light is not our enemy. And it can be a friend and it can be a friend more and more. It's about using smart and scientifically informed ways of using it. So with that, I'd like to finish and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kristen Hussey and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Copenhagen, where I work between the Medical Museum and the Novo Nordisk Foundation Center for Basic Metabolic Research. At first, I just want to say thank you very much to the organizers um, for putting on this event and for inviting me to be here with you today and to tell you a little bit more about my research. I'm a historian of medicine and I'm interested in thinking about how historical perspectives can help us to better understand the context of scientific and medical research today. Uh, and in my current project, that's the study of circadian rhythms, which you'll have just heard a bit about. We now tend to think of light and light exposure in quite negative terms, for example, how the blue light from your phone affects your sleep. So when I started my research project looking at the 19th and 20th century contexts of circadian rhythms, I immediately looked to this period, the introduction of artificial lighting, uh, at a time where I expected to see a lot of people complaining that new electric lights were making them sick or they couldn't sleep. However, what I found was actually quite the opposite, that the introduction of electricity was seen as an almost universal boon to health. So what I want to do uh, in my talk today is to think a little bit in a more nuanced way about the role of light and artificial lighting and its connection to our health over the past centuries. I want to argue that at different moments in time, light and lighting were dangerous and sublime, and sometimes both at the same time. 
And I want to suggest that given these changing attitudes towards lighting that we see in the past, that in the future we're going to come to think about electric lighting not as something that's inherently bad, but as something that needs to be moderated and carefully consumed. I think it's important to start to think critically about how we remember the light environments of the past. When we look at paintings like this one, we're seeing a very romantic scene of the countryside by night. And while a bright moon like this one might have been bright enough to see by, the nighttime of the past was extremely dangerous and replete uh, with dangers to health. So traveling on the road past dark was dangerous from, you know, you could fall off the road, or you could get into a carriage accident, or you could fall into a stream or a pond and drown, uh, or you might even be attacked by bandits and thieves on a dark road. Uh, and indeed, there was a famous learned society in the Enlightenment period called the period called the Lunar Society based in Birmingham, and they gave themselves that name because they always met at the full moon because they knew they were going to be able to get home safe on that bright night. In our cities and homes, nighttime presented, you know, similar dangers. Here you can see British artist William Hogarth depicting a dramatic, admittedly imagined scene uh, of a London street after nightfall uh, as a really chaotic, dangerous place with things like hidden thieves, carriage accidents and fires, or maybe even having uh, a chamber pot poured on your head. Uh, many early modern cities implemented a curfew and paid a group of night watchmen to patrol the streets and try and reduce nighttime crime but nevertheless, evening burglaries were extremely common. And in big cities like London, link boys uh, carrying torches um, had a whole trade in offering safe passage home through the city on dark nights, although apparently some of them were bandits and thieves themselves. The lighting of streets for many decades was actually the responsibility of the individual homeowners, uh, which meant that provision was pretty patchy, you know, to say the least, it's very expensive to light the streets. And some historians have argued that providing public street lighting was actually an important moment in creating the modern nation state. Light environments inside the home in the pre-industrial period were brought with, I mean, similar tensions. Rooms lit by firelight or candlelight or even a rush light would have been really cozy, um, would have facilitated, you know, socializing and definitely wouldn't have gotten in the way of you producing, you know, the sleep hormones you need to sleep. Although, as historian Sasha Handley has observed, the fact that all of your dinner guests probably couldn't leave after dinner because it was too dangerous to travel the roads by night meant that people's sleep was already pretty interrupted. Some scholars uh, argue that European societies took place in a second sleep or a two-stage sleep pattern, um, but the evidence for this is a little bit patchy. On the other hand, homes lit by naked flames like candles and fireplaces were extremely hazardous and often resulted in burns and fires, especially in homes where there were children who didn't know to stay away. Uh, to say nothing of the damage of eye to eyesight caused by staying up and reading by candlelight and the potential hazards that could occur in a dimly lit home full of sharp implements like scissors and knives. Wax candles were extremely costly and most people would have used something like this only when they absolutely needed to. The 19th century brought huge changes to our relationship with our light environment, first with the introduction of gaslight in the early part of the 1800s, and then by the end of that century, electricity. Compared to candles and fires, gas lamps at the time seemed nothing short of magical. As one newspaper wrote in Wonderment in 1815, gaslight completely penetrates the whole atmosphere and appears as natural and as pure as daylight. The gas lamp was widely welcomed for its brighter light and its ability to illuminate the home, streets, and crucially factories. The increased ability to travel, work, and socialize after nightfall is directly linked with the progress of industrialization in Europe and elsewhere. Gas, however, came with its own set of problems. People found that the light was too bright and less flattering than candlelight. Gas lamps were, I mean, bright enough to work by, but they still would have damaged eyesight if you looked, uh, worked by them a lot. But gas is also highly explosive, and accidents set the public on edge about whether this is really a safe technology for them to have in their home. Like a candle or a fire, gas was also liable to combustion, especially if it was brought into contact with flammable fabrics, which were everywhere in the Victorian home, from clothes, rugs, uh, and curtains. There were also famous cases in theaters and music halls when actresses sort of brushed their skirts up against the footlights that were lit with gas, uh, only to find themselves engulfed in flames on stage. Gas is also poisonous, and leaking gas taps represented a real risk to life in the home. Gas also has this unfortunate effect of removing oxygen from an enclosed room, um, which created what the Victorians called a close and vitiated atmosphere. 
Uh, so looking at this picture of a large gathering in a stately home, you know, you can only imagine what it would have been like to stand there with all these gas lights burning. It would have been hot and just completely airless. Um, in workspaces like the London Central Post Office, which was lit by hundreds of gas lamps burning simultaneously, again, this would have felt hot and airless and uncomfortable. And Victorian doctors believed that living and working in these kind of atmospheres had like, a really direct effect on your health, causing weakness, anemia, and even tuberculosis. So it's, it's kind of hardly surprising then that when electricity arrived, it wasn't just an exciting new technology, it was believed that it was something distinctly healthier than gas. However, electricity had many of its own hurdles to conquer. The Victorians were keenly aware of the possibilities for this new technology to shock, burn, or kill them. Um, and many people were hesitant for that reason, you know, to have it put in their home. Historian of electricity Graham Goody has shown that Victorian women were especially against the introduction of this kind of light into domestic spaces, both because it was dangerous, but also because of its harsh, unbecoming glow. And entire books were dedicated to trying to, say, domesticate electricity, suggesting ways that rooms could be decorated to help cope with this bright and glaring light, particularly through the use uh, of kind of decorative lampshades like we see in this image here. But arguably, no group was more enthusiastic about the potential uses of electricity than the medical profession. Light was rapidly incorporated into medicine, both as a diagnostic and a therapeutic technology. Uh, this strange looking image on the slide actually comes from a book about how to use high frequency currents in medicine from about the year 1902. By the end of the 19th century, physicians had already been well aware of the value of exposing their patients to bright natural sunlight, which is called heliotherapy. Extended stays in outdoor high altitude places uh, like Switzerland or luxurious coastal towns in, in cities like Nice had been the preferred treatment for, uh, for tuberculosis for many decades. Indeed, heliotherapy remained popular well into the 20th century um, at sanatoria, again, in these high altitude places, um, but sometimes it was also used in the home. Some local physicians or even families might have built small heliotherapy sheds in their back gardens, so family members suffering from this disease could spend as much time outside in the sunlight as possible. Um, but it was Danish physician and physiologist Niels Finsen in the 1890s who began to experiment with the application of bright electric or artificial light to cure disease, and that's known as phototherapy. And Finsen was using an arc lamp. Now, an arc lamp is a form of electric lighting that was trialed in the 19th century but never really caught on. Uh, in the 1840s and 50s, a number of cities tried to install arc lamps, um, but it almost never turned out very well. Uh, this quote comes from an experiment with an arc uh, light in, in Paris in the 1850s. Strollers out near the Chateau Bourgeois yesterday evening at about 9 p.m. suddenly found themselves bathed in a flood of light that was as bright as the sun. One could have in fact believed that the sun had risen. The illusion was so strong that birds woken out of their sleep began singing in the artificial daylight. And it was so strong that ladies opened up their umbrellas, not as a tribute to the in inventors, but in order to protect themselves from the rays of this mysterious new sun. So in this quote, I see some really tantalizing clues about the effect that this bright artificial light had on the natural rhythms of the living beings around it. Um, but the reason why it wasn't really implemented was not so much that, but more aesthetic, that it was too bright, too unnatural and uncomfortable to look at. But in this intense sunlight, uh, artificial sunlight, Finson saw what his Danish patients rarely received, exposure to a light as bright as the sun. And he used bouts under an arc lamp to treat patients suffering from tuberculosis of the skin, and the results were magnificent. Uh, the medical museum where I work still has one of Finson's arc lamps, and also they have a large collection of wax moulages showing the progress of his patients at his phototherapy institute. Light therapy became widely practiced in Europe, uh, but in the first half of the 20th century, and the discovery of vitamin D in the 1920s, specifically that the exposure of the skin to bright ultraviolet light supported the production of this crucial vitamin, made sure that bright light therapy was a popular treatment for common nutritional diseases like rickets, uh, especially for children living in inner cities who didn't receive enough daylight. Wealthier people in the 20th century could also do phototherapy at home with products like these ones, um, which we could see as the forerunners of modern sad lamps. But of course, light therapy is never without risk. Suntans were initially seen um, that the patient was responding well to the light therapy, but new research in the mid 20th century started to connect this damage with the skin to skin, uh, 
to, from the sun to skin cancer, and it started to cast doubt on whether light was actually this sort of universal cure for everything. So when I looked back at the age of electric light, I expected to find that sudden outpouring of illness associated with the new technology, but I was disappointed. However, this isn't to say that people in the 19th and 20th centuries didn't worry about disruptions to their bodily rhythms. They wouldn't have used a term like circadian rhythms, but doctors and patients felt that modern life was somehow taking them out of step or out of rhythm with the world around them, as this passage from Joseph Mortimer Granville demonstrates. He says, civilization has borne us out of the sight of these natural landmarks, and we steer by a needle and chart of our own fastening. The philosophy of health preservation consists in an intelligent study of the natural conditions of repose and obedience to this law laid down for our guidance so far as nature can be harmonized with the artificial, a sad reversal of the processes of nature. As Granville indicates, the problem was not really the action of electricity or electric lighting on the body so much as the fast-paced modern life that it facilitated. Uh, now that people could work around the clock uh, by electric light, many started to wonder, you know, what is sleep? What is exhaustion? Where does it come from? And what are the limits of the human body? We do know that the Victorians suffered enormously from insomnia, exhaustion, gastrointestinal order, uh, disorders, and contagious diseases like tuberculosis, which could have been made worse from compromised immune systems. Could we read some circadian disruption into this? Possibly. Today, circadian science is demonstrating how our bright homes and cities have, can have a negative impact on our health by disrupting our circadian rhythms. But it was because of the promise of electricity to make our homes, our streets, and our hospitals healthier and safer that we are surrounded by electric light and continue to benefit from it. It's little surprise that cities considered economic and cultural powerhouses tend to be the brightest ones, although many homes around the world still struggle with access to safe, reliable artificial light. Whatever way you look at it though, light has always been a double-edged sword. It's at once a danger to us, and it's also offered us a vision of a healthier, happier home and society. I suspect that in time, chronobiology is going to help us to better understand our relationship with electric light and how we can continue to benefit from it, but at the same time using it responsibly and moderately. So thank you for listening. Uh, if this is a topic that you wanna learn more about, here are some sources you can read I highly recommend, and I've also included my email if you'd like to get in touch with me and talk more about it. Thanks very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy the symposium.
hello, my name is Donald Lally, and I'm an architect, a researcher, and lecturer in design at TU Dublin School of Creative Arts. And this talk will be called Lights Out. To control light is to control time and space. It is to work and to play and sleep on schedules that are designed by us and designed for us. Artificial light has a footprint. Uh, it is a mixture of uh, human time and energy and natural resources. Artificial light is an infrastructure which sees nature as consumable. Um, nature becomes a kind of fuel. Uh, with, with artificial lighting, nature is something to be experienced as and when we wish. For, inf for infrastructural theorist Paul Edwards, uh, quote, infrastructures constitute an artificial environment, channeling and or reproducing properties of the natural environment, which we find most useful and comfortable, providing others which the natural environment cannot, and eliminating features which we find dangerous, uncomfortable, and merely inconvenient, end quote. Human-made lighting is a mature technology. It's per perhaps the most mature technology, rendering it ordinary and unremarkable. It quietly resides in a kind of naturalized background alongside trees, daylight, wind, and rain. We depend on it. We only notice it when it fails, which re these days it rarely does. Human or technological error typically blame for failures. Um, social causes are actually rarely invoked. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Marshall Ber Berman, um, where he's talking about Karl Marx, who he describes as unveiling the modern bourgeois as consummate nihilists on a far vaster scale than modern intellectuals can conceive. But these bourgeois have alienated themselves from their own creativity because they cannot bear to look into the moral, social, and psychic abyss that their creativity opens up." End quote. Modernization is an ongoing process of hiding human labor and, and, natural, and the natural resources required to maintain this naturalized background of modern society, this naturalized background of artificial light and other infrastructures. This talk will explore the relationship between human-made lighting, artificial lighting, um, labor and architectural space, stretching from the campfire to the post-human factory. In Greek myth, when the gods were making animals, uh, including man, the Titan Prometheus whose name means foresight, gave to his brother Epithemus, meaning whose name means hindsight, the task of handing out traits to each animal. Each trait worked for the survival of each animal. So Epithemus, Epimetheus uh, started giving a positive trait to every animal, but lacking foresight, he realized that he had distributed all the, the traits without having left one for man. Prometheus then frantically searched for a human survival trait. He stole fire from Hephaestus and practical wisdom from Athena. So he stole fire from the gods and he delivered it to human, human humanity. The history of, of fire or the history of artificial light is the history of the figure suppressing the ground. I want to draw your attention to a detail in the painting uh, that of the fennel stalk used to transport the fire. To the best of my knowledge, there is little scholarly or otherwise interpretation of this detail, um, but obviously vast amounts on the fire itself. The husk in, is the infrastructure used to transport Promethean fire. Um, and for historian Lewis Mumford, infrastructural technologies are container technologies. And a container technology, in this case, the fennel husk, foreground the figure of the flames. They bring forth the figure of the flame while making invisible the ground of the husk. Uh, in the Promethean myth, if fire represents the birth of culture in the human, well, what does the fennel husk represent? I would argue it is the gift of infrastructure, the ground onto which the figure of culture can come forth. The first use of artificial, artificially produced light probably coincided with the domestication of fire. Um, it is tentatively assumed that we've used fire for as much as one and a half million years. Um, but the first real evidence of deliberate controlled use of fire is in the caves of Peking Man, or Homo erectus, dating from about half a million years ago, where fire is assumed to have been used as an illuminant in the cave. Um, oil, such as sesame oil or other fat-burning lamps, alongside candles, 
were the principal form of illumination until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this period is roughly 42,000 years. The history of artificial light is the history of ever increasing scales of material and labour extraction. For 550,000 years of human activity, it took 58 human hours of chopping wood, moving wood, to produce 1,000 hour, 1,000 lumen hours of light. Now, if we look to 1992 on this kind of list, the same 1,000 hours takes 0 0.00012 hours to produce. In his 1851 text, The Four Elements of Architecture, Architectural theorist Gottfried Semper puts Fort Fire as the first and most important and moral element of architecture. For Semper, the first human groups assembled, formed alliances, and developed a religious concept around the domesticated fire. Quote, throughout all phases of society, the hearth formed the sacred focus around which took order and shape. End quote. Ancient, ancient Europeans, having tamed the garden, paved paving the way for the agricultural revolution, sought to subordinate fire to the rule of order. In Latin, the word hearth means focus. The hearth fire became the focus of social life. Houses were built around the hearth and villages and cities were constructed around communal hearths, which all, often took the form of a perpetual flame. For Europeans, the orderly and obedient anthropogenic hearth fire became the sacred symbol for a disciplined and orderly society. According to environmental historian Stephen J. Pine, civilization would be impossible without fire, end quote. In ancient Rome, a sacred order, the Vestal Virgins, sustained the Ignis Vestae, or Vestal Flame, at the Temple of Vestae, um, dedicated to the goddess of the hearth. For, Roman, for Romans, the shrine at Vesta predated all others, it came before all others. It had no inauguration, for it had always been there. The Vestal Virgins maintained the Vestal Fire's purity through a strict diet of oak. They call this materia. The oak tree, tree, tree is the most likely of all trees to be hit by lightning, and thus was the pan-cultural symbol of the gods of lightning, such as Zeus and Thor. Lightning purifies the oak, the oak feeds the Vestal Flame. Keeping the flame alive and under control was seen as vital to maintaining the shape and order of Roman society. The temple burned down at least four times when a feral spark escaped the hearth. Um, in Hiberno-English, the pronunciation of heart and heart are almost indistinguishable. For folklorist Henry Glassie, quote, the heart is the crucible of continuity. Here at the center of space, people work to unify time, keeping a fire alight that consumes the intervals between the generations, between the great days of every, and every day and night, end quote. Modern technologies do not reveal the source of their power, but transform them unrecognizably. For the philosopher of elemental media, John Durham Peters, electricity is repressed fire. In 1882, Tom Edison switched on the electric grid, supplying 10,000 lights to lower Manhattan, an area that included the Wall Street district. Edison did not only invent the early version of the light bulb, an early version of the light bulb, but developed the whole underlying infrastructure for turning it on. Here on the right, right hand side, we see an exhaustive lip, list of the raw materials, fuel and labor needed to design, build and manage the coal powered Pearl Street station designed and supervised, the construction supervised by Edison. This was the world's first coal generation power plant. We jump to the mid 50s. Electricity is now cheap and, ab and abundant, the mid 1950s. Electricity has now become cheap and abundant. Artificial light and air conditioning and the activity of shopping are kind of consummated in the new architectural invention of the shopping mall. The enclosed mall would be a physical impossibility without artificial lighting. No other architectural type before that achieves such depths of interiority, such as uh, such an extent or such an extent of an artificial environment. Victor Gruen is the purported inventor of the enclosed mall and designer of Southdale Shopping Centre in Minneapolis, the first enclosed mall. Here he sets out his sales pitch. 
quote, free from the slightest daylight or natural ventilation, thereby eliminating dust and at the same time creating better air washed mechanically ventilated ventilation and more uniform pleasing artificial lighting result. In many ways, the elimination of windows adds to the beauty and to the selling efficiency of the store, end quote. Architect Rem Kohlhaas describes how, quote, at the end of the 20th century, with shopping escalating to a scale and density and pervasiveness that operates more effectively as a landscape than architecture, shopping composes enticing environments where sound, scent, light and air and even plants are all manipulated to extract the desired uh, response from consumers. Nature now services the most artificial processes. Uh, not only by becoming a mechanized manifestation of commercialism, but also by operating as one of the primary mediums to lure the consumer. Um, he goes on, a new nature now exists in a technologically modified or denatured form. This new nature has been reconstructed to mimic original nature or to replicate landscape and can be understood as a technologically enhanced version of landscape. This technology called replicate it is a, is a composite structure, part real, part synthetic, created when organic material is technologically improved. These new vast interiors of artificial light need an artificial nature um, to complement them. Again, the idea of the labor involved in maintaining polite, uh, plants inside an artificially lit uh, public space becomes too expensive. So a new artificial form of nature replaces real nature. This real nature, um, designed by a, a one company here called Preserve Treescapes International, um, a replicate palm tree, they're often real trees grown in controlled conditions, harvested once they've reached desired height and girth. And they're carefully dissected in a laboratory resembling the back room of a funeral parlor. Um, each segment of bark and frond is removed from the palm, drained of its water content, dunked in embalming fluid, and then allowed to desiccate. Uh, quote, skilled artisans, end quote, are, are, thought, are then brought in to reconstruct the tree, weaving the bark segments on, into a hollow PVC pipe. Steel receiver ends are in, inserted at the top of the pipe with up to 40 receptacles for attaching preserved fronds. At the base, with their root balls amputated, uh, preserved palms no longer need special planters, such as the such that one maker of Replicate advises, quote, merely bolt the trunks to the floor, end quote. If the pervasive use of artificial lighting to control and extend schedules of human labor or other activities started in earnest during the Industrial Revolution, so in parallel did the drive to eliminate the human itself from that labor. Here we see the first automated flour mill designed by Oliver Evans. Evans described his automatic flour mill as follows, quote, these five machines perform every necessary movement of the grain and meal from one part of the mill to another and from one, part, one machine to another through all the various operations from the time the grain is am emptied from the wagoner's bag until completely manufactured into flour without the aid of manual labor except for to set the different machines in motion, end quote. The automatic factory, a factory with little or no human presence, has been the dream of engineers for more than 200 years. And in recent decades has become a reality. This post-human process is called lights out automation. Lights out automation has been a dream of engineers for, as I say, 200 years or more. The goal is to push a button and let the machines work unattended. Machining centers can be set up to run all night without any human intervention. On assembly lines, artificial intelligence, automatically guided vehicles, data analytics, flexible, flexible feeders, predictive maintenance, programmable logic controllers, remote diagnostics, robots, sensors, vision systems, and other technology make it easier than ever to implement a factory, implement factory automations with few if no or no humans involved in the process. And the purest definition of lights out refers to a fully automated facility where human hands never touch a product during their entire manufacturing process. So in theory, a true lights out plant would operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the only down, with, on, with downtime only for maintenance and repair. 
So to conclude, uh, it seems to me somehow as a species, our capacity to extract from nature has always been connected to and limited by our ability to control light. So lights out is perhaps the first step in relieving humanity of the hard physical toil of production, but, is may, but it is maybe also further alienating us from the rhythms of the natural world. Thanks. Hello, with a nod to you too, I'd like to tell you about the city of blinding lights. So if we took a, an image of the Earth from space, this is a mosaic uh, with a sensitive satellite, what we see is there's light spread around the Earth. Um, there's a little bit of light in the tropics, this is due to slash and burn agriculture, so clearing of, of trees, and this probably would have been visible over a large part of the Earth which was forested, but since uh, about 150 years ago, the advent of electric light and relatively cheap energy has led to the spread of light in uh, communities. So we can actually trace roads and rail networks, Trans-Siberian Railway here, centers of population. So light is tracking development. Um, and as people are developing and improving their economy, then light is actually increasing. So at the moment, only 20% of the world's population can see the Milky Way. And light levels are increasing in area and overall intensity then by 2% per annum. And this is continuous over the last decade or so. 99% of the population under US and Europe uh, conditions cannot uh, actually see a, a pristine sky and the light polluted. They can't see the Milky Way for the most part. Um, and this is causing uh, issues then that they, they're divorced from the sky. This wasted energy also has a cost, it's about two and a half to six billion a year depending on the exact nature of the energy generation and so on, and also is equivalent to about 19 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is something that we're aware of that we need to cut back. If we look at an image of Europe taken in 1992 and then step forward to 2010, we can see there's a big difference. So the light is actually spread out, not only is it tracking the centers of population, but is also spreading out across the countrysides. Places like uh, the Benelux countries, they're actually quite bright overall. And if we look at Ireland, we can see there are cases where there's relatively little light. So it's a commodity, if you like, that we have part of the environment uh, which is relatively untouched and which we should preserve, just as we preserve other parts of our countryside. We can look at this another way, look at uh, a color map showing the relative uh, growth or uh, decrease in light over the period 1992 to 2010, we can see the increase in light occurring here in Ireland. The red showing an increase, about 20% uh, an increase across the countryside. Other countries have actually seen a decrease. We see these blue light levels. And Northern Ireland has been red, white and blue, a mixture of increase in some areas, decrease in others. There are other locations shown in white where light actually truly hasn't changed, so in the dark sky areas. If we look back at the Celtic Tiger era, we can see that there's been an increase of light, an increase of about 60% over that period of light. And as a check to make sure our measurements are correct, we can measure the total light output of Northern Ireland, and we can see that's remained relatively stable. So in the Republic, we've seen a 10 times faster growth and after the Celtic Tiger era, we can see growth has leveled off a bit, less wide-scale development. We can look down from space, and here's an image taken in 2015. We can see quite a bright center for Dublin, a lot of lights, and this is taken near, the, near Christmas time. We've got a nice advantage of the color images. We can see the type of lights, so these bluish or blue-white lights indicating the modern LEDs uh, for the most part, or mercury lighting. We step forward to 2017. It actually is a little darker because we're now um, away from Christmas. Similar time of the night, but just a different time. And we can identify key features. Croke Park up at the top, 
to help the grass grow, the lights are on at night. Um, the custom house is quite brightly lit. Um, the convention center, and again, any light coming out those windows is going to go out into space. Uh, government uh, buildings and uh, the Taoiseach's office are quite brightly lit and those buildings have got a light coloured facade as well. So we see pockets of, of colour which is due to LED lighting um, but generally the colour of uh, orangey colour from old sodium lamps, the orange lamps, and the yellowy colour from high pressure sodium lamps. So we can actually uh, do an inventory of the light in the city and work out where it comes from. About 50% of the light overall inside the M50 comes from the residential areas. They're quite extended, so even though the light level is relatively low, it counts towards the total production. So commercial retail, 10% each, about 20% of the light. Public buildings count for a few percent, even though there's a relatively small number of those. Proportions are similar for other Irish cities. So where does this light go? Well, as I said, in the case of the government buildings, we've got uh, Portland Stone. It's quite bright. It's going to reflect the light, but it also travels out outside into the countryside. And what it leads to is the image we show up at right, uh, which is the white centre, the centre of the city, really bright area. This is an estimate of how bright the sky will appear. It's not the localised source of light, it's how much of an area is affected. So as you probably realise, you've got a bright source of light, it's going to affect an area around it. We do that for all the lights, we can see that we're going to start to blur out the sky over a large part of the country. So predominant part of the population sees some degraded sky. So if they look at, at the zenith, if they look straight overhead, you can see some effect of the light. A very small percentage, but it's measurable in astronomy terms. The purple areas or cerise area in the uh, image is an indication of natural skies. You can see it just touches parts of Kerry, uh, a little bit of Galway and, and into Mayo and Ackle. Um, the dark blue is pretty good skies, and that's where most of the, the parks and reserves that we've protected so far uh, are. And then the green area, we're starting to see a bit more light. If you looked on the horizon, you'd certainly see the light domes, the scattered light over towns and cities. And then we get into the red and white areas. Not going to be possible to see a lot of stars, maybe a few hundred stars instead of thousands of stars, and the Milky Way will be invisible. So. Only a small proportion of the population sees light with uh, skies without light pollution, the majority living in towns and cities. And uh, what's scary, perhaps, is that 18.5%, nearly 19% of the population, the light is so bright where they live that they use their color vision at night. But what's good is that on the west coast, along the Wild Atlantic Way, there are some areas where we can have dark sky reserves because there's no other light on one side and in some cases we have mountains and so on, such as the Reeks down in Kerry, to block the light from larger towns. So it provides us with an area that we can actually cut off from the surroundings and put in good quality lighting and actually protect the night sky. Earlier in the year for Comet Neowise, we can see from the Dublin Hills a lot of white light going up into the sky from new lighting. It makes the comet look, you can see it, but it doesn't look that impressive. We go to a dark sky much more impressive, much more contrasting. Another indication of what happens if we blank out the sky, we've got an image here taken in Galway and an image at the right taken, you can see a little bit of the light at Clifton uh, on the horizon, but a very good wide-angle view of the sky. What we see is as we move from full moon indicated at the bottom there, bottom left, to uh, full moon at the right, and the, the dark of moon, new moon in the middle, we can see that the light conditions fall generally. There is a change during the night when the moon comes up. But when the moon goes down, we see how dark the sky can be. And it forms some sort of a monthly cycle. It goes down to the natural sky level there, the way it's plotted. We're plotting in factors of 10 for each of those ticks. If we, on the other hand, we look at the city, we look at Dublin, we see an image at the top right actually taken in the suburbs. If you have very sharp eyes and the image is quite good, you can maybe make out the uh, Big Dipper or, or the um, plough up in the top right, but it's actually very hard to see. It's more or less swamped, much more shorter exposure than the one at the bottom. And what we see here is that the uh, sky level is running at about 30 times the natural. So in the city centre, if we look straight up, the sky is as bright as if it was full moon time. So we're masking out the lunar cycle.
by putting in this diffuse light. And all of that light costs money. The other effect it has, uh, it has effect on the environment and animals and birds. And we could see at the top over millennia and the uh, birds have evolved to actually find their own little niche in terms of singing so that they don't interfere with each other. It's clear their sing is, is, singing is relatively easy to identify. And also when they're up and about, they're going for maybe different food sources so they're not competing as much. But the singing, if we look from the chaffinch to the blue tit, to the great tit, to the blackbird, to the robin, we can see that they sing at different times. And the scale on the left, the negative scale, is time in, uh, minutes before sunrise. So it goes from 20 or 30 minutes for the chaffinch to about nearly an hour, say 50 minutes before sunrise for the robin. So they all have their little slot. But when there's light around, we see a much steeper picture. So now the chaffinch is not so sensitive to the light. It sings fairly close to sunrise, so you add a little bit of light, it doesn't really affect its singing time. But for a species like the robin, which normally sings about 50 minutes before sunrise, now its singing time is brought about an hour ahead, a bit more. So it's, it's offset from its natural cycle. This can have an effect on reproduction. The species will have an effect on uh, the predator-prey relationship and also the success in hatching. For instance, for the blackbird, it's been found that males exposed to light for a couple of uh, years will actually not be as fertile. So it has an effect. If we look at uh, trees, for instance, as well, we can also see an effect. So if we shine light on it, it comes, it changes development. So early in the season, the trees or the flowers will bud a little earlier. And in the winter season, they may hang on to their leaves for longer. In this case, it's fairly extreme. It was about 10 days before Christmas. And we can see there are green leaves on this tree close to a light. Fairly extreme because it means that the tree has to keep sap there. It's got a, it's making energy from that light, um, but it means that the tree is still active. The leaves are hanging on there. They're also getting blown about. It's stressing the tree. So the tree should be dormant and it's actually partially active at this time. Of course, the time that bud bursts and the time that leaves hang on has an effect on species that depend on the tree and maybe pollinate the tree. So that's going to have a knock on effect elsewhere. In a cultural connection, the image there at top right shows carved stones on the curb around Nauth tumulus at uh, Brunavoigne. We can see the Milky Way above it. We've coped in the past. We've been around for millions of years. We can cope with the natural environment. The ratio of, of the brightness of, uh, from regular moonlight up to full sunlight is about a factor of a million to one. In fact, uh, our vision is actually quite acute and even in, under full moonlight, you can read a paperback book. But go out and you can try it yourself. Under full moonlight, if you hold the book up perpendicular to the, the moon, you'll find you'll be able to read the fine print. If we put light in, then as we saw before, it shields us from the sky, disconnects us from the environment, and that will cause stress. If we're isolated from the environment, as we've realized these COVID times, it actually causes stress. As we'd heard earlier, from Professor Coogan, it also creates health effects as well. Conversely, getting out in the nighttime environment and going out with friends and family actually creates a sense of cohesion. It actually reduces stress, reduces your heart rate, gives you a feeling of connectedness. And I always find in the evening, as it gets darker, there's that feeling of relaxation. In the morning, you know things are speeding up and the world starts to become more active. It's a nice, quiet time to get out and relax. It also provides a sense of wonder, just being able to look up at the sky, seeing a meteor shower, even seeing satellites going overhead. It makes you wonder, it makes you see something outside yourself. Part of that has led to us having, uh, we've had a couple of star parties up at Nauf, the Irish Astronomical Society. And the image here shows uh, a laser beam going up into the sky, pointing out stars to people. At, again, at the Tumulus, about 5,000 years old, something our ancestors would have known about. Some of these tumuli have alignments. We know New Grange is aligned to the midwinter sun. Some are aligned to the lunar calendar. Again, wouldn't indicate it. We're quite sensitive to the environment as we'd have to be in those times when we're depending on animals and planting and so on. 
More recently then we've got images such as the beautiful images from Van Gogh, the starry night image, wonderful, and also the cafe terrace. And we can see he's emphasized the stars, has big impact. We notice how dark the houses are behind. So our natural and our cultural heritage is to have a natural sky. We're cutting ourselves off from that. There is a cost to light pollution as well. The image right showing you those sources of light. And we talked about that light getting scattered. Well, it's scattered so that we can actually measure it with a sensitive light meter. In this case, the image there shows a meter I use. It's actually a sensitive photocell. And I can actually measure the number of watts falling on the ground, the light watts, and convert that to electrical watts, knowing the efficiency, and work out the cost of this light. And for Dublin, which accounts for about 30% of the total light, I estimate it's about 4 megawatts of electrical power required to put the light out into the surrounding environment, out to about 40 kilometers away. And that's equivalent. It's not actually, I'm not ascribing it all to public lighting, but just to put it in contact, it's equivalent to about a third of the public lighting energy budget. And that's about 70 gigawatt hours over the year, 2.4 million euros for that light, and about 8,000 tons of CO2 it's responsible for. What can we do then? Well, if we're sky friendly, and I don't say necessarily turn the lights off, just be smarter about how we use lights, we can actually save money, energy, and carbon. We reduce a possible environmental stressor. Climate change is occurring. If we also mess with the light cycle, that can be an additional stressor that will just prove too much for some species. And remember, on an island, there's really nowhere for these species to migrate to or to come in and replace the existing species. We're going to be ending up wiping out species, and there have been large declines in the insect population that are quite worrying. Exposure to the night sky, on the other hand, connects us to the wider world and the environment, it makes us more aware of our surroundings. Now, potential health benefits, less light helps us sleep at night, but it also has tourism potential, as I noted. We're on the outskirts of, of Europe. We have a commodity not everybody has. We conducted a, a citizen science project in the Irish Times in 2018 and found about 80% of the respondents of, out, out of 464 that responded uh, in Ireland, we had more from around the world, but just the Irish ones, 80% show they were interested in night events and it's brought in about 400 bed nights in Mayo. In Scotland, for instance, similar sort of environment, cloudy nights and so on, they've worked out it could generate several million for the economy. And that's been demonstrated in other countries as well. So this potential benefit, and again, that goes down to the local economy. The cultural connection as well, um, Newgrange there, a UNESCO site, if we protect the daytime environment and we stop the car parks and so on developing, but we let it be floodlit and have a lot of development that casts light onto it, we're not really fully protecting our heritage. And the quote that's much used in the States is, half the park is after dark. If you just protect the daytime part, you're not really totally caring for your environment. The positive thing, though, is, of course, that we can flick a light switch. Although the effects of the light pollution may last, if we turn the light switch, the light stops right there. Unlike other forms of pollution, they may stay around in the environment. The issue we've known about plastics, for instance. So what can we do? We should take some action ourselves. Warm white light, is we're less sensitive to it in terms of our sleep cycle. Insects are less sensitive, bats are less sensitive, and so on. But only light what needs to be lit. Keep the area confined. Don't use big floodlights if you don't need them used only where it's required. You really need that light and you need that light on all the time. Do you need to light up your trees in your garden and affect the birds roosting there or can you turn those lights off? Use the minimum amount necessary and again if we're dark adapted we don't need that amount of light. In fact excess light, glary light, does the opposite. It makes it difficult to see things and creates dark, dark shadows. And put it on a timer. Use a sensor. But use it wisely. There's no point having that sensor going on every 10 minutes or going on when a car or a person passes along the road. So set things up correctly. A lot of these things are set up during the day. Check it at night. Be polite. Dim your light. And if you've got you know, a nice glass box, beautiful new extension, don't be afraid to close the blinds or the curtains. Remember that energy is going out. You're paying for that. If you close the curtains, it'll actually be brighter inside. 
And I'd like to leave you uh, finally on a quote by a philosopher who said, It is indeed a feeble light that reaches us from the starry sky, but what would human thought have achieved if we could not see the stars? And I think particularly in Ireland, where it can be cloudy, the nights that we see the stars, we should savour them. And if we protect the environment, we're also passing something on to the future generation, not only a better environment, but also leaving them with the sense of wonder on the universe around us. Thank you.